Right, right. Yes, I have shot up tillable wire, but I will not do this today. I'm different. <laughs> and, you know, whoever's out there using, and you are my purpose. Just talking to you. I'm not going to talk you out of it. Just being present with people. Um, I don't know. That's what gets me excited in life today. It really does. Last year, last December, I was able to donate my kidney to someone. I don't know who the hell got it. Some Somebody in Texas or something. I didn't want to know. Yeah, see, listen, I'm real spontaneous like that. I just wake up one day like, I think I'm going to try to give him a kidney. I'm just, I'm just real. I just want to give away my kidney yeah. today. Erica is an ex-heroin and meth user that has turned her life around and become an anti-drug advocate in her community and a responsible mother of four. As if raising four kids and having several jobs wasn't enough, she donated her kidney to a complete stranger just because she could. I was very grateful to sit with Erica for this episode of Chopping It Up. So, you just celebrated five years clean. Yes. How's that feel? Um, I mean, it feels amazing. Um, that's a long time. It's a long time. It's a big accomplishment. It's been a struggle. Uh, I put in a lot of work. Right. So, what was you? What are you clean from? What was your drug of choice? So, my drug of choice was heroin. Um, but. I mean, I guess my drug of choice is uh is everything pretty much. I'm what they call the garbage can user. Right. I yes. gotcha. Yes. Yeah, I'm kind of that way too. I like a little bit of everything. Yes. But certain ones I like more than others. Right. Heroin, right. opiates, sanexes, that was my thing too. Yeah. When did you start using? I was fifteen years old. I was fifteen years old and I started smoking. I quickly went to pills and then cocaine. And um, I mean it escalates pretty quickly. Right. Yeah. Was it the people you were running with that was just able to get these types of things or was it? Uh, you know, I had a pretty rough childhood. So, you know, uh, my parents were going through a divorce. I had way more freedom than I probably should have. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I kind of ran with that freedom. And I yeah, when I was 15, I, I was running with guys that were much, much older than me. So I wanted to do everything they were doing. Yeah, that's usually where it starts. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. I run around with guys that was older than me when I was young, thirteen or so. You know, they were eighteen or whatever, but he didn't do that type of shit. But once I hooked up with the crew that did, man, it was off to the races. Yes. All we did was support each other on the next high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's a wrap. <laughs> right. So no overdoses. No, no. Thankfully, I I did get lucky. I, I've never overdosed. Um, I feel like I came close quite a few times. But when I did use, I hung out with some old heads and they kind of looked out. Right. And so, you know, um, there, there was one gentleman, he was, he was, I, he must've been 65 and he really taught me on, this is how we prevent that. So I, I'm blessed with that, that I didn't have to go through that. Yeah. Cause nowadays they're just grabbing it and using it with no knowledge. Yeah. Other than what they've done before. Yeah. So you never did no fentanyl? You never liked the fentanyl? Would you around for that? You know, when I was using, so, you know, five years ago when I was using fentanyl wasn't like such a thing. And now as I, as I look at people using, things have changed. Now it's yeah. all fentanyl. You know, when I did heroin, it was actually straight heroin. There wasn't nothing in it. They didn't have to put anything in it. Right. Um, we had scramble caps and in the, right. yeah, yes. yeah, I remember. So, you know, times are crazy now and, um. At time times have changed, you know. There, everybody's on the fentanyl, so no, I, n I never did that. And the meth too. So you said you got off of heroin with meth, and that didn't. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's actually a funny story. I was withdrawing pretty severely. Um, I had a friend come over, and he's like, "I can make your withdrawal stop mm. right now." And you know, when you're sick, oh you will God. do anything. So I was like, "Okay, whatever it is." I'd been sick for days, so he does. He gives me meth. And of course, instantly the withdrawals are gone, but I couldn't blink for six days. <laughs> I couldn't blink. I couldn't sleep. And, oh um, man, grinding your teeth to pieces. Yes. Ugh. And meth made me very psychotic. I, I always say I, I only did meth for maybe a year, but like it did more damage to me than the heroin in 15 years. Um, I, I went completely crazy on it. Didn't sleep delusional. And so in the end, that was some, you know, the last thing I used was meth. And uh, I had went to jail looking, you know, maybe 90 pounds looking like Skeletor. So it, been there. It, yeah. Yeah. It I've been crazy. there. I went in and, uh, Jesus, I guess it was whatever it is. Oh, two. And I was like 155 pounds. I'm six, six, I'm two fifty now. And that's, yeah. 
So, yeah, I know. I, I never liked the meth. I never did the meth. But as far as the opiates taking the weight off of you the same way, you just get trapped in this circle of get high, get high, get high. Yeah, yeah. Drink something every once in a while. but Right, right. And like anything that you do, it's so exciting the first time and it's just not fun anymore. Yeah. Like it, it becomes like I enjoy this and so now I just have to function. Yes. I have to function. Once um, it becomes a habit, that's the worst part about it. Yeah. And, and some people can use the same drugs and not ever find that. Now, you know, they can use it two or three days in a row and then just quit. That's not me. Yeah, I don't know if I know anybody like that. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely known people that have used it off and on or pain pills, for example, that they can just take pain pills. Like my mom, she could take a pain pill two or three days in a row because she feels bad and then not worry about it for two years. I can wow. never do that. No, I couldn't either. And and that's a hard concept for me to grasp, somebody that can do that. Um. And and that's something at five years that I'm still looking into. Like, why am I an individual that, you know, I have compulsive problems with everything I do or everything I take? Um, so celebrating five years in this past year, I've put in so much like inside work because they always say like drugs is not the problem. It's not a problem at all, but it is definitely our solution to everything. And why is that? So I've been digging deep this past year. And I, I have some serious issues with anger. I'm such like an aggressive person. No way. I would never yes. think that. Thank you. Because it's working. Like I, I increased my therapy and, you know, reading books. And now I am calming my anger. Um, so let's just say something pisses you off in the moment. What do you do right then? To Is there a, a, something in your head that you go through that says, hey, I don't want to act this way. So this is what I'm going to do type thing. So I did anger management for a year. And I think it began as when I got anger, angry, I, I'm like, I'm not going to say anything. And I clenched my fist. But I think the more that I did that, it became easier just not to flip out. Um, okay. You know, because at work, I, I've, I've got two write-ups for physical assault. and An older guy. I, what? I cracked his head and it busted his lip. <laughs> Jesus. So, like. I would never <laughs> think that of you, man. I swear I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, it occurred to me, like, I can't act like this. It's not okay. Like, right. People are, like, scared to say anything to me. So. I've been exhausted this past year, but I've been in so much work to be a calmer person. <laughs> and the problem was the problem about changing is you have to want to change. I enjoyed being that angry person. Um, I enjoy being a complete psycho. And I think it has something to do with having control over people. You can control people with anger. So like it was hard to change because I, I, I liked who I was, but um, I'm trying to help people today. So you can't help people when you are this aggressive person because people are going to steer clear. Or, or, yeah, you already got that negativity about you. Right. There's a, there's like, I feel like it's a negative gene in my family. And and I think as, as humans, we're also designed to look at the negative because it's so easy to see that versus the positive. But my pops, it was just like, rah, 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 rah. everything sucked. There was two good things in the world and everything else sucked that day, every single day. And I think that passes down. And I always looked at him like, you're such a miserable dude. And I don't want to be like you because yeah. you're miserable. You're very smart. You helped me learn a lot of shit, but you're so miserable that people don't even want to be around you, man. And that really made me change that part about myself too. So you were an angry person. Oh, too. absolutely. And yeah. I still am. I still am. But instead of those flip outs, I, I, I just kind of, you know what? It's not a big deal, man. Why am I going to let this affect me my day or how I'm going to feel or how I'm going to talk to my girl when she calls or this tattoo message? I'm going to act like a dick. Come on, man. That's just ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I can't see that about you. I mean, you appear pretty intimidating, but you don't seem angry. Yeah. And I am. I'm a teddy bear, man, for the most part. But when I get to that point and for me, it's either you said something about uh, uh, you challenging in the moment. For me, it's like... I'm there and I'm challenging it and I either flip the fuck out immediately because I don't think about it yeah. or I stuff it way, way down. And yeah. then, and then later on, if something else happens, that might come up too. And then that's a problem for me is I have to learn to speak on the shit that I don't like in the moment sometimes without being mad Yeah, and just be like, hold on, man, this is not cool. Whatever. Instead of like, fuck you, because that's where I want to go anyways. So uh, you said jail was a part of your story, too. Yes. So I have been to jail 17 times. Uh, the only reason I know this is because of the last incarceration. The guard said, well, this is your 17th time here. Mm. You are now part of the Frequent Flyer program. No shit. And I asked him what I want. And he said a nice <laughs> one room with a bed and uh, three meals a day. 
So I never forgot that because like they were laughing at me that I had been locked up 17 times. Um, and I don't even remember wh when that was, man, it's been so many years. So, um, yeah, 17 times. I, I think I can't even count the, like the total number of time I did. I've, I did like, you know, two uh, one year sentences and it's just, it's been a lot. All right. Enough that you had it all up here three uh, or four years inside. Yes. Yes. A lot of wasted time. Right. What did you do inside when you were in? Did you gamble? Did you? Um, so after the first couple of incarcerations, I learned pretty quickly that in order to do time, you have to make yourself comfortable pretty quick. So mm -hmm. I learned how to do that. I don't know. I was really mean in jail. I wanted everybody to leave me alone. And I was like the mean girl. And it worked like the complete opposite. Everybody wants to hang out with, with the, the mean bitch in the pod. I don't know why it's weird, but no, I mean, I did. I, I played a lot of spades and, um, I don't know. It, it all seems like a blur now, like thinking that like all this time that I did, you're just going through the motions, you right. know, like really don't know how to play spades. So you do it in jail though, right? <laughs> I'm actually a spades beast. You can't really learn till you do it in jail. Though. Right, right, right. Like, I mean, maybe there's people in the streets that play that much, but when you play it that much, you just learn how to know everything that's going to happen nearly. I yeah. can I can count the cards down to the last card. Yes. I, can, I can tell you there's one heart out there. There's two heart, you know, whatever. I can count every card when I'm really on. Do you ever play Pinochle? I So I played a couple of times, but Pinochle has a lot of rules. It's hard, but it's, it's so fun. It's hard to keep up with. 80 cards instead of 52. Yeah. And I tried to play poker in there. Listen, inmates get real serious about their poker. Yes. I can't mess with that. But <laughs> that's the one table I never sat at. I think I sat at the poker table one time, lost five bucks and never sat down. again. Yeah, they, they get pretty serious. Even the women. The, the, they, they... See, that's what's crazy, though, is because like I've sat in many men's pods, but I've never sat in a chick block like that. I've seen a few, you know, TV shows and things like that. But uh, are they are they? Is there, is it the same as it is with guys? Is it like some chicks are disgusting, don't shower, yes. things like that. Oh, and then other people are in there three times a day. Yeah. I, I feel like if they don't shower, the girls smell so much worse. <laughs> so the guards used to say that as far as fights, uh -huh. the girls hands down so much worse than the men. No shit. Because women are petty. Right. You know, you could do the smallest thing and we're ready to pop off any, uh, you know, at the drop of a hat. Yeah, we're so. doing it whole time. I almost did. So, you know, part of my part of my recovery was entering into the local drug court program. So there was a, a woman in there that had violated a minor. So three of us kind of like ganged up on her and she got assaulted. So I was getting ready to get released for drug court and we all had, you know, major charges for this. So because I was getting ready to get released, I went in and confessed that it was all me. And so I was supposed to go to the hole and I knew I was getting released in a couple of days to drug court. So. Uh, so before you got to kangaroo court, you got home. Yes. Yes. So th that was the closest I, I ever, I ever came, but you know, what'd y'all do to her? Um, well, we caught her in the shower, mm -hmm. kind of some, you know, lock in the sock bullshit. Ah, uh, wow, you went hard. Yeah. But she was a young girl that had, you know, hung out with a 13 year old and we actually saw her story in the paper and we're like, Oh hell no. Hell right. No. So we did give her an opportunity. We're like, you're going to go hit that button and you're going to leave this pot. Right. She should have listened. And she didn't want to go. No, she's like, I'm right. not going nowhere. And I'm like, had a okay. Choice. She didn't think y'all was going to do anything. <sighs> yeah. She didn't know the wrath of young Erica. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I definitely had my run-ins with them type of people as well. I remember going in the last time I went in and there was these two white kids in the bottom block. And you could tell they was both in on shitty charges. You could just look at them. Every time they would open a door, they would come and talk to me asking me questions. And he started asking me questions like, uh, why would they not give you a bond? And I'm like, they didn't give you a bond. He's like, no. I was like, well, there's probably a victim. There's probably something wrong with yeah. your case. He says, uh, oh, yeah, per se. I was like, bro, just get the fuck away from me. Don't talk to me no more. So then I ended up in work release like a month later and I seen the newspaper came out. His own child, he had taken his own child and shaken him. Oh my God. So bad that like it, it ruptured a retina, caused brain damage. And I was like, dude, I wish, I'm glad I didn't know that. Yeah. Because if I would have known that then, then it would have been, I don't even know what I would have done. Maybe I would have hurt him. Maybe I wouldn't have, but I wouldn't have got the work release. Absolutely. And I hear all the time, like, especially, I think it's more with the guys. It's, it's rare to find a female that 
you know, as a, as a predator, but you know, they, they do, they torture them. They don't allow them to eat. And, um, I, I think eventually like they're segregated, but it's just funny who you're around in there and you have to learn to deal with people. Like it's and, tough. And it, yeah, it is tough. And I was talking to someone that just got out recently and he's like, there's six or eight pedophiles just walking around yeah. on the block. Like it's normal. Like they're regular everyday people. And I just don't feel that way. When I was going in, they were in productive custody because they didn't, you know what I mean? Y'all want to go up there and watch little kid shows, do it up there away from everybody else. We don't want to know about your perversion. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And now they just let them walk around with everybody else. Like it's normal, normal shit. Yeah. So thankfully we don't have to deal with that too much. in the women's pocket. Yeah. Yeah. The girls don't have that problem. Except for that one and time. Is, <laughs> right. And at the same time too, it's like if some teacher has sex with some boy and then he's just a hero and she's just great. <laughs> It's totally different than it is it the is. other way around. It's just the way society looks at it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so five years clean, are you going to meetings? What are you doing on a daily basis? So I do. I go to a 12-step fellowship. I actually sponsor, I think, four girls now. Shoot, it's a lot. Um, and then, I, you know, I do my, uh, my therapy. But, yeah, I'm part of the uh, 12-step fellowship. I have done my 12 steps, completed it uh, earlier earlier or I'm sorry, it was last year that I completed it. So, you know, I have a sponsor. I spent a lot of my time trying to help people. Um, as a matter of fact, like I, I just had some friends recently go back out. So I just posted on Facebook. Mm. Um, you know, if you are someone out there using, whether you want to quit or not, like call me, you know, because when I was using, I never had anyone to call. I, I don't care if you want to quit or not. We all just need someone safe to talk to. So I haven't gotten anything from that. Yeah, and but. You, and that's great because you have an understanding of that. And yes. that makes a big difference. And somebody calls you and you're just instantly like, well, you need to and you got to. I try my yeah. best to do the same thing, too, because I have buddies on the same shit. And I try my best to just be like, all right, man, you know, what are you going through? What's up with you? What are you going to do next? Like, I'm asking them what they're going to do instead of, like, pointing my finger at them. Right. Even if you're calling and you're using, like, I don't want to stop and I'm like alone and I'm scared right now. Okay, cool. Let's talk. I haven't had anybody call me yet, but you know, this past year, um, being clean, I just, I try to help people because mm. we're supposed to, you know, it helps say, to keep you clean too. Yes, absolutely. And I didn't understand that till like, you know, later on, they say, call people when you need help and you feel like you're bugging everybody. But then I got some clean time and I realized when people call me, like, I felt like I was being of service. Right. You had a purpose. Yes. Yes. Um, so, you know, I have people in the morning, um, you know, they call me from rehab just for someone to talk to. Um, I it's kind of like a little family that you build. though. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like when these people start calling, I have a crew of groups that I talk to and some of them I only talk to once every two weeks. Some I talk to almost every day, but it's a little family. I have. It is. Absolutely. And I enjoy talking to them. I want to know what's going on with them. One of them has been coming off of gabapentin for, six months now and I've been you know helping you come down through tapering because I actually just quit about I don't know f six eight weeks ago so I was on that shit for a year and then I just figured like bro this stuff is fucking my brain up yeah they say it's bad now. it's fucking your brain up man yeah. because I was on this roller coaster where I'd be like hey blah, 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 and then I'd be like oh my god the whole world sucks oh that's so true and then I'd be like blah, 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 and then I'd be like oh my god the whole world sucks and I couldn't control it and one day I just said you know what fuck this I'm done I'm yeah. not tapering. I'm not doing shit. I just took a bunch of punches to the face for three or four days. Felt like hell. But that's when I really started learning all the shit about changing your dopamine habits and all that. This is a totally different thing. But um, yeah, I still talk to him a lot. And as he tapers, he tells me how he's doing and how he's getting better. And yeah. I like hearing that. I'm glad to hear that from him, that he's doing better instead of saying, oh, uh, I actually, I took four extras the other day and he don't do that no more. It's been months and I can't wait till he's done. Right. And we can sit here and say, dude, now how do you feel? You know what I'm saying? You quit drinking. You haven't drank for six or eight months now. You're, you're working and killing it. I just, you know, I think that's interesting, but I definitely like talking to him. And then Eric just finished cancer. So I talk to him every day. I mean, how's that feel to come off of cancer? Uh, he's so he's done. Yeah. He's done with the treatment. They're getting ready to do uh, some type of thing to see if he's still got cancer or not. You know, okay. see if we went into remission. But so at the same time, too, like he's bouncing back, man. And it's just like helping them people by talking to them or whatever, you know. It yeah. definitely helps me to stay focused on what I'm doing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
yeah, I I have, you know, a network of people that I, I've built that I we check on each other every single day. So it's like I don't even have friends anymore. You just this is your family. Mm-hmm. You know, people that I, I've seen in meetings and we see the same people. And, you know, it, it is it's, it's like a family. So, um, you know, it's amazing to have those people. So totally off of that topic completely. This is what I call the time machine question. So if you could get in a time machine and go oh, back geez. to one certain point or change one interaction or whatever, did you feel like shifted everything you did one way? Can you pinpoint that? Oh, God. Um, the, the, I, th- I think there's like so many moments. Um, you know, when, when I was young and I was hanging out with the, you know, the 25 year olds, I probably wouldn't do that. Or there was a time when I was a teenager and I was living by myself for a while and there was parties every day and a lot of bad stuff that, that happened. But you know what, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me that if you could go back and change anything, what would it be? And I would, I always say absolutely nothing actually, because, you know, it's the old butterfly effect. I feel like, you know, um, God didn't make me go through this, but he allowed it because if he didn't, I wouldn't be able to help the people I help today. Everything has a purpose, right? So if I didn't go through all the addiction and the jail and everything, then I couldn't look in the eyes of someone today like, I know where you're at. I wouldn't have that understanding and I would be a whole different person. So I don't know if I would change anything. I needed that experiences. I needed that. Because it was to serve a bigger purpose today. It's a great answer because it's, it's, it, you're humble and you're not, it, there, it shows there's no regret. No. You don't regret what you did. You know what I'm saying? And I have regrets and I often think that question. And I'm like, would I change it? Because I am who I am now. But if I could go back to then and change myself, the pain that I caused myself and my family and all yeah. that shit through my addiction and prison years, I would change that shit in a heartbeat to not have them have to go through it. I wouldn't even care about what it did to me. Yeah, that is hard. And they always say addiction is like a family disease because the family's hurting just as much as we are. And we don't really see that at the time. Yeah, or do we care? Right, right. We don't because we're addicts are so selfish. We want what we want. We I'm want a now. selfish person anyways. And I try <laughs> so hard not to be like, I'll give you anything. You want something I got? I'll give you anything. I'm nice as shit. But I'm selfish when it comes to my time. And like, there's yeah. this, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I shouldn't do that. People will call and I want to talk to them and I'm like, oh, but I'm busy. And then, you know what I mean? I feel guilty for feeling like I don't want to answer the right. phone. So then I'm like calling them back because I didn't answer, yeah. <laughs> you know, because I'm trying to change that about myself, man. Uh, which is one reason I changed this whole channel thing around to the way it is now, because I want to bring more attention to people like you that, yeah. that, that can, you know, have a good word and have something to say instead of just my experiences with all this shit. Because right. mine are pretty extreme in some ways and other people's aren't, you know? Yeah. But again, I've learned a lot of shit 17 times in, in jail, uh, aggressive and angry. That was something I would have never thought of. And I'm so glad to hear that today. Like, because, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, people were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, you seem like a very abrasive person because, you know, I'm like talking to people with my hands and coming at them. Um, and it's funny that you say like people calling on the phone um, and you say you're busy because... I have lost so many friends um, that's something I've been trying to do for the past couple of years. Like I had posted um, on Facebook, if if your friend died tomorrow, what are your last words with them? What is your last interaction with that people, with, with those people? Because so many people call or they're like, you want to hang out? We're busy. We're working. I have learned to make time for people today and not to even during addiction. You know, I've had people in recovery that car accidents and stuff, and you don't know what your last day is with someone. So make time for people today. Like we are all working our lives away to get money. Like for what? Um, that time you can't get back. So, I mean, it's a hard lesson I've learned this past couple of years. I've probably lost more people than I have in my whole life. And it's it's been painful. So I just constantly remind myself, make time for that phone call. You're irritated. Cool. Talk to them anyway. Because that's going to be your last conversation with them. Yeah, absolutely. I think about that every time my daughter leaves, like when she's going back to college yeah. or she's going overseas sometime, it's just like, it's just scary to me. Yeah. And then I go to the crazy parts where I'm like, what if somebody abducted her and like child trafficked my kid? You know what I mean? I mean, she's 21, but she's still a beautiful girl. And I feel like it just scares me that my brain even goes yeah. to that well, crazy I mean, it happens. Place. And unfortunately, that's the way of the world today is like, you know, yeah. sex trafficking is, is a huge thing. 
And a lot of people don't know it, but Northern Virginia is one of the key p- parts that do that. I'm not sure why that is, but mm, no shit. Yeah, I, 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 and you know, I'm like crazy mom of four, so I did my massive research, and North Virginia is like a, it's, it's, you know, it's up there on like the the top states for some reason. For what, like kidnappings so or I, uh, sex trafficking? So how how do you look that up? What's what what what's the statistics say? It says this many boys were taken, this many girls. Or so I don't remember what I I looked up on because it's it's been years ago. But I just did research on sex trafficking in Northern Virginia, and like we are up there on the list. Oh, and it's, shit. yeah, um, and I don't know. I see all these things on like Facebook. When Sally sees that she's gonna be scared to death. Oh, don't don't. Because her little her little daughter goes out and just doesn't listen, and and she, we've talked about uh, me getting a van and just snatching her ass up to show her that it could be done. Because she acts like I oh. can fight him off. I can fight him off. You're 11. You're yeah. 75 yeah, pounds. Yeah, you can. I will take you anywhere I want to take you. I yeah. promise. What they had put um, and I I use Facebook for all the news and awareness because that's what they do, but. You know, something about, you know, a guy's daughter was going to work. And when she got out of work, there was a ribbon on her passenger side door or, you know, on the tailgate. But that's what they do. Right, they right. they they They're watch you. They it. tie the ribbon and it lets whoever know easy target right here. Yeah. So also I've seen the stickers that, that a lot of women put on the back of their cars. It'll be like wife three kids, two yes. dogs. They see there's no husband in that picture. Right. And, or there's no dog in that picture. And then they think about, Oh, well they got two little kids. There's no dog going to bark. There's no man on the, you know what I'm saying? So then they make, yeah, I've seen things like that too. Yeah. Scary shit. It is. It is scary. So I don't know. I'm, I'm the crazy mom that does all this research, like to be aware and super strict. Cause our, our world is different today. You know, it wasn't like that when I was a kid. You know, they weren't snatching kids up. They were trying to get rid of their kids and pawn it off on another parent. Like, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, they used to let us let, let you uh, get beaten by your neighbor's dad right. when I was a kid. It's yeah. like they call and be like, "Max, Jamie's acting up." You'd be like, "Whip him! Just beat him! <laughs> yeah, go send him home. Just beat him!" <laughs> yeah, they don't want to do that no more either. Right, right. But yeah, man, I like uh, I like the fact that you, you know. You do what you do and you continue to do it in that way. It's hard to do too. It is. I mean, I mean, there, there's just so much work to, to put into it because, you know, you can get clean, but until you put in the work and take care of the reason you used to begin with, you're always going to return there. Just like I look at people that like recently have relapsed and they got clean and they stay clean for a year. Um, but until you deal with your problem, you, you got to do like the deeper work or you're always going to have that that feeling inside of you that something's not okay. And, you know, all we know is to numb. We, Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes, yes. We don't know how to deal with shit. We just want to go, like, numb ourselves and not deal with it. Um, So, I mean, it, it, it's been sad to, like, w- watch people rela- relapse. But that's the only thing I can teach them is you have to deal with your shit. And at the same time, too, I feel like there's it's like a magnetism effect. Like you take two magnets, they're either going to go together or they're going to push apart. Yeah. And the the further I get away from those things, the more it pushes apart. There's it's not a there's not an attraction anymore for me. Right. It doesn't even attract me to going over and doing that. All I see is failure and misery on that end. Yeah, it does get easier as time goes on. Um, And I still have my moments where I'm like triggered, but like they're easier to deal with today. And I have a lot of people to call with like. Um, to call when I have those moments, but in five years, like I have a three story house with all my kids living with me or, and so like sometimes when I'm triggered or I feel like down, I just look around. I have so much shit in my house. Like I've earned that, right. you know, one time I was homeless, leaving, yeah. living underneath a bridge. I can't walk in my house cause I have so much shit today. So like, Right. I don't know. And you got your kids there, which is more important than any material. Yes. Thing. Yes. Because at one time I, I didn't have any of them. And um, you lost custody. Yes. My two older ones, I lost custody. And my two younger ones was in the care of family, which I still had to fight for them. But, you know, I earned that back and I, I fought and I got them. And I try to keep that in mind because they drive me absolutely insane. And I just I try not to take things for granted. Yes. I don't forget that first day where, you know, I am crying because I don't have my kids. Right. So, I mean. Same as that first day in jail in that cold, dark cell and you're sitting there going, what in the fuck was I yeah. thinking? Yeah. 
everything yeah. you care about is gone and then you, you realize that I wasn't grateful for any of it. Right, right. Because when you're behind the walls, time stops. Yes. Time creeps by so slow. <laughs> yeah, man. So dealing with it every day, though, I feel like that's the same thing, too. You got to you got to turn on something that that makes you deal with what's going on every day without searching for that drug. Right. Because like something happened and I got buddies that still do the same thing. Something happens like, oh, I'm, I just want to. Nah, man. Why can't we talk? Why can't we just go bullshit or do something else instead of you looking up that crack man or whatever it is that you're searching for? Right. You got to find something else to look for instead of the dope. And see, that was one thing when I got clean that I was afraid of. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do now? I don't have nothing to do. I used to go to parties and stuff all the time. And there, there's so much shit that I've done. Like, I've been parasailing. I've never been parasailing before, but I'm like, my God, there's a whole freaking world mm -hmm, out here. Mm -hmm. um, boredom and recovery is not a thing. No. But it's, we don't know what else to do. But I, I figured it out pretty Yeah, quickly. yeah, me too. Uh, I, I started wakeboarding and boating and shit like that that I just love doing, man. And I would have never done that when I was getting high. Right, right. But I never even thought about it. And people in recovery have all these events. There's these massive recovery, like camp outs. And people in recovery party, it just, you know, and when I heard that new, I'm like, yo, party, their partying is different. I, I associate partying with drinking and using. That's it. But their little party. Okay, so you're a purist too, though. You don't drink. You don't smoke weed. You I do absolutely nothing. nothing. I do not take medication. I have, I don't know when the last time is I've ate an ibuprofen. It's probably been a couple years. No shit. You don't get headaches or nothing like that? I do. I find an all natural way to okay. take care of it. I'm very anti-pharmaceutical. Um, cause I've did my research on yeah, that. Too. I hate them. I, me too, man. And I swear it's like, uh, if you've seen the dope sick or the painkiller things where they talk about them, people that did the oxys, have you seen either yes, one of those? Yes. Now that lived through all that. Like I remember when oxys first hit, they're, they're horrible. Like we was doing two or three little hydrocodones and then dudes like, Oh, there's 40 oxys in this, or there's 40 little Percocets. Yeah. And now I can, you know, and then I'm shooting them things up and shit. And those people got rich. Yeah, they did. And they never did a day in jail. They got richer and richer and they're still getting rich from it to this day and never had to face any kind of consequence whatsoever. Right. I, I feel like I'm I'm a little bit uh resentful. For yes. That. yes. My fucking life was ruined around those pills. Was it my choice? Yes. But I also feel like uh, uh the Vicodin and the Percocets would have never been as bad as what the oxys were. Right. Because you can't sniff them, you can't shoot them. It wasn't eight at one time or 16 at one time. Right. The oxy air was like a very, it, it was a horrific, a traumatic time for a lot of people. Yes. Like a lot of people died off that. And they, I know people that got them prescribed and, and That's where it started they're, they're no me. longer here. That's where it started for me, man. Now, I mean, I was doctor hunting this shit, you know, uh, but I found a crooked doctor. And he would just write us oxys and somas and valiums. Yeah, whatever and, whatever. and next thing you know, it was a rotating 15 of us that would take each person down. Like, I would take you. If you had insurance, we're going. Yeah. Because your insurance is going to pay for everything. It's going to cost us like 45 bucks for $500 worth of medicine. Yeah. Get in the car. Let's go. You know what I mean? And that's the way we did it, man. And all of us got, it got so bad that in the parking lot of this doctor's place, he was open from like 10 to 12 in the morning and then like 6 to 8 at night. So from six to eight at night, we would be having pizzas delivered. There's needles laying in the parking lot where people are just sitting there getting high, going in and out of this doctor's office like it's a dope house. Yeah. It's, it's just crazy. And it definitely tore this whole place apart for sure. Yeah. Me and all my buddies we just got, you know, I ended up doing, I robbed a pharmacy. Fuck. For Oxycontin. That's right. You did. I saw it's your. Uh... Crazy, man. <laughs> like, who does dumb shit like that, dude? Yeah, lessons learned, though, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's about moving on, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, Windshield's bigger than the rear view. Yeah, and I mean, it's good you can laugh about this stuff today. Like, damn, I did the dumbest shit. <laughs> and I think the biggest part of it for me now is I, I'd rather be able to teach people, uh, like, you don't want to do this. Trust me, you don't want to do that. Like, I think that's one thing that my kids did learn from me, even though it wasn't me doing it, is what not to do. Right. You know what I mean? Because... <laughs> I did what you shouldn't do, and they haven't done it. They're not drug users. They both finished high school. My daughter's in college. My son's got a great job. He's married. And if I had to go through that for them to be what they are, then okay. 
But again, back to the regret thing, you know what I mean? Because there's so many other things I would have rather been a part of. And that's one thing I try to, um, That that's one of my huge life goals is I will do anything I can to make sure that my kids do not follow my footsteps. So when I go to the meetings and stuff, my little kids actually come with me. Okay. And a lot of people are like, that's not okay. All the people sharing the stories of this and this. No. My ki- younger kids are 8 and 12. I need them to hear those stories. Right. I don't care how brutal it sounds. How inappropriate, because you're going to get older and you're going to run into an opportunity. And I want you to think back why I heard this in the meeting. I don't think this is okay. Like, I I want something to sink in your all's little brains because, you know, I've got five years. I'm doing the damn thing. But, you know, it's all about them. They are our next generation. What are Mm -hmm. we doing for them? Um, So, yeah, that's I just making sure, which, you know, my older kids, they're 22 and 18. Neither one of them have did hard drugs. Right. So I am like super grateful for that. Um, so, I mean, I guess, you know, and I think what I relate, what, what first thing that makes me think of is my grandparents were alcoholics and I mm-hmm. never drank because I watched them fall down, get yeah. drunk, burn their hands. I mean, I watched horrible shit as a kid from them drinking. So like that was never my thing for 30 years till I ever even really liked a beer. Right. Right. So I think it's like seeing that addiction or whether it's good or bad or the, you know, whether it's the meeting side or mom's falling down all the time, it's like, makes you not want to do that as yeah. a kid. Right. You would yeah. hope so. Yeah. yeah. And I talk to my kids a lot because they, um, you know, they've been old enough to kind of see me, you know, go to jail and not looking okay or sick all the time. So I spend a lot of time talking to them now that like, you know, I was, I was a sick person and, you know, even my eight year old, I explained that to him in terms that he can understand. But I think it's really important that you talk to the kids like I owe them an explanation. I absolutely do. I was absent for their life for years and I need them to understand why I've showed them my mug shots. And, you know, after I had did meth and look, went to jail looking like Skeletor, I showed that picture to my little boy. And he's like, who's that? I'm like, that's me. I was really, really sick. Mm. I had all this poison in me. But now I look like this because the poison's out, you know, um, and that was probably a couple of years ago, actually. So he would have been like six or something. But I wanted to explain to him. I owed it to this kid. Right. I remember when I was a little kid and you have these memories, these traumatic memories in your brain. Well, I want to explain that to you. So, you know, I don't I don't want to leave them in the dark about anything. And also, it's, it's more accountability. You're yeah. being accountable for what you did, how it affected them. And you want to you want to make up for it. Absolutely. I'm not going to leave them in the dark. And, um, you know, I need to own up to it because I, I was a bad mom at one time. Right. And um, so I'm going to own that today and we're going to move on with our amazing life. And But I'm not going to leave you in the dark on that. Like some people think like, oh, kids are resilient. I don't have to tell them anything. They're kids. Well, then they're going to grow up and that's always going to be in the back of their mind asking questions like answer them questions today. Right. Well, if you don't teach them how to take out the trash, they're not going to know how to do it. Right. Right. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the world's going to crazy place with all that too, man. Um, I've cut out watching a lot of videos, but some of the shit that I was seeing, that's like, I mean, these people are shooting meat tenderizer into their veins. And, oh yeah. And their arms are nearly falling off and they can't stop putting it in them. Like, Jesus Christ, man, that's bad. Ain't it? What can we do for those type of people that like, you're literally, I can't, I don't, no matter how bad my addiction was, if, if I would have seen things like that happening to myself, no fucking way I would have kept doing it. Yeah. No way. I just know me. I know that when I started fucking my body up, that's when I was like, yo, this is not working for me. This is not working for me. I can't keep doing this. And, and you know, sometimes it took jail to get me off, but I've, I've quit a couple of times laying in my own bed, detoxing and shit, just because I, I didn't want to keep living that way. And man, I just can't imagine having that much power over them to keep shooting when your arms literally open wounds that they won't even take them into the they can't even get help because these wounds are so bad. They won't even let them in. I mean, I guess the pain of withdrawal uh, to them is, is worse than their, their skin deteriorating, you know? God, that's a terrible withdrawal, ain't it? Can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, I, I've had some, some pretty bad ones. Me too. And, you know, uh, so it, you know, when I was in jail, they, they used to like, there would be these prostitutes in there and everybody would make fun of them and, and they would tease them and call them names. But, you know, I broke it down to someone like this, you know, you are on the corner selling your body because your fear, you are terrified of those withdrawals. They're so painful. Every hair on your body is an absolute pain and shaking and you will do anything you can steal, sell your body, whatever. So you don't have to feel that pain because that pain is so, so great. Um, but I think there's a line we draw. 
Because for me, it's like, I would never touch a kid. I would never right. do anything crazy to a child, regardless of how I was feeling. I, I know I could make myself go through anything before I would hurt a child, sexually or violently. Right. So there's like lines that we draw. I know I would stop before my arm fell off. I know I would <laughs> stop before those wounds festered. You know what I mean? And and I guess what you're getting into is like different people have different lines it that is. they draw in the sand. Because I am not somebody that would ever you know, sell my body. I wouldn't. Facts. All right. See, so you understand what I mean? That you feel like there's a line you draw. So where in the hell is those people's brains going where there's no line to be drawn? I think there's a lot of things that depend on that, like how long they've been used and how much they're uh, using. Facts. Yeah, yeah. Because if you're, you're how bad you in, really feel. Yeah. Like a gram a day, man, it does depend on the severity of your sickness. And, and some people are just at a place in life. They just don't care anymore. Um, I've been watching videos and like, I guess, um, Kensington, I, yes. I, I have this big thing on Kensington, Man, which horrible. now they're cutting it with something. And I think it might be, yeah, what you're talking Trank. about. Yes. It's That's eating exactly their, their it skin. Is. Yeah. So one it, of my main it's goals. It's Trank and meat tenderizer. They put meat tenderizer in yeah. there. So it's going in there and it's coming back out through the skin is the way I've heard it explained. I'm not sure if I'm completely right, but like the meat tenderizer makes the skin soft the same way it does a steak. Right. And then the yeah. drugs that don't go in, the binders or whatever the hell's in there, I'm not a chemist, but are working their way back out through the skin and it's just lacerating them. Yeah. And there was one video I watched where like you could almost see the guy's bone and it was so bad that they had a group of doctors and nurses walking around on the streets yes. like, hey, can we help you? They because do. they're not going to go to a hospital they and they're just like deteriorating. Um so one of my goals, uh, which, you know, people tell me I'm not ready. I don't know. But I'd like to get a crew together, a big crew, and go to Kensington to volunteer. Like handing out food, water, blankets, whatever. Um, I've been saying this for the past three years, and everybody's like, you're not ready. You have no idea. Um, my kid's father's actually from Philadelphia. So he says the same thing. Like, you can watch the videos. It is nothing compared to when you are standing in it. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to do that because I seen um, another guy. He did that. They had a truckload of people filled with water and stuff. Yeah, and you like, got to have some. You got to have a, a group of people that can't be run off easily, and yeah. you got to be protected. You can't go out there just two or three chicks and right. And I've seen dudes go out there with videos, and it's several guys, and they're big guys, and they're still getting run off. And them it's coming people crazy. Yeah, you know, they'll come right at you. You got that camera, especially if you're recording something. You know, these guys are recording videos. They're like, no, that's not happening. Right. So that's what my kid's dad told me that he's like, if you go up there, even like four or five people, what's going to happen is the dope boy is going to know why you're there and they're going to make sure you leave. So. Right. Because if the if the users like you there, the dealers probably won't. Right. And if right. the dealers like you there. Yeah. Makes because sense. we're coming there to help people. Right. They don't want these people help. These are their regulars. Yeah. They want them in the hole. But it's just so sad, like everybody's sleeping on the street and stuff. And if like I can go there and just give you some food and water and make sure you're warm, then, you know, OK, because a lot of these people don't want to stop. This is the only life they know. Right. But I'm not there yet. I'm hoping eventually I can. Uh, Man, get... it, and, you know, it's cold as hell up there right yeah. now. Like, what are them people going through up there right now? I yeah. mean, Jesus, you're sleeping on concrete. And if you can't find a place to sleep, how do you even live through the night? Yeah. I can't imagine. They, they have told, people have told me that like, if you're walking down the street, there's so many people that is, is overdosed or, you know, cold or deteriorated that they actually said, I don't know if this is true or not, they said they have a truck that goes through to checks for life or no life. And then, and they just, they put them on the truck. Just pick them up if they're dead. Yeah. Yeah, because there's so many people they overdose and they're laying everywhere, so you can't tell if they're they're alive or, or dead. Right. So they they have a truck that checks on everybody. I'm scary shit, man. Yeah. So you know, maybe if I if I, if I get another couple years, I will organize some kind of group to go down and and volunteer because, you know, and, and that's the thing. Like you can get all these year years clean, but you have to use it for a bigger purpose, and you know, you you got to help other people because there's a ton of people out here struggling today. So that's what I aim to do. Yeah, man, that sounds good. I like it. Um, I like it. I'm on I'm on board with the same thing. I did a. Uh, when I did uh, rehab time in prison, whatever, uh, we did a nine month therapy thing, therapeutic community. Everybody's yeah. there with everybody all day. And then I ended up being a mentor for like a year after that and teaching all that stuff helped me to learn more about it too. Right. And uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it when somebody didn't understand something and I was able to help them understand it. I think yes. that's cool to be able to help somebody 
get it, especially when it's something good. Just like I like teaching people trades. If you can yeah. learn how to build something, I know it's going to make you money. It's back to I can give you a fish and you eat once or I can teach you to fish. Right. Absolutely. So the same thing. I want to teach people how to stay clean instead of just showing them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And from going through drug court and, you know, they have us see all these therapies and all these people. When I did that, I realized that there was such importance to like, if I'm going to talk to someone and they're trying to help me, it is so important that they have walked in my shoes. And unfortunately, we didn't have a lot, a lot of that in, in drug court. They just had a bunch of degrees. They had no experience. So it is so important. If I wanted someone to help me, I want to look in the eyes of someone that truly understands. And so that's another reason why I really do it is because there's, there's not a lot of people in that career field that have that understanding. Right. You can't get a degree and understand where I'm coming from. I don't, I don't care how much you study. I, I, you have to have that life experience. I like that you said that too, because that's kind of where I've taken this that way, because I can't talk to you about being rich because I'm a broke ass white kid. What? That's right. I can't, I can't talk to you about yeah. certain things that I know nothing about them. But when it comes to addiction, I know that I can tell yeah. you about that. I can tell you about how people have been through it. I can tell you because I've been through it. Prison. I know how that is. Tattooing. I know how that is. I can tell you about those things. Right. So I have to be able to have some kind of value in order to make any of this work. And I feel like the value in this is teaching people how to not be fucked up, how right. to not ruin your life. And if you are in the midst of ruining your life, there is a way out. Yeah. Yeah. And there's value in that for sure. Doesn't matter how bad life gets today. It is not as bad as when I was using. Never. And and I try to remind myself of that because my my bills will be like a week late and I'm like oh my god like I'm failing and I'm like today I have normal people problems it's okay like it's okay I'm not in the cold I'm not sick so I have to constantly remind myself that because like you know I'm taking care of four kids by myself like and you know trying to pay everything and I'm like it's okay ain't nothing getting shut off our food is filled your our fridge is filled with food right. so like it's okay. I'm, I'm dealing like it took a while to grasp that, that my problems today are like a normal person. I don't have a problems fanatic today. So, um, yeah, it's fine. Living, living a pretty, like pretty good too, life. Though. Yeah, that's good. That's why I wanted to get you on. Cause I know you have certain coping mechanisms, regardless if you can pinpoint them or put them in a drawer and call them something, you have things you're doing on a daily basis to stay doing what you're doing. Yes. And that's what I wanted to get out of you. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's funny because, after using heroin for 15 years, meth couple years, like, you know, we do recover, right? Our bodies heal. So one thing that is, you know, so amazing to me and not to like pat myself on the back, but last year, last December, I was able to donate my kidney to someone. I don't know who the hell got it. Some, somebody in Texas or something. I didn't want to know, but like, man, I used heroin and shot shit up in my vein for 15 years. And you're talking, my kidney's good enough to give to somebody. Like, that's crazy that, and I say that cause it just blows my mind. Our bodies do heal. Um, give yourself some time. And like, I'm just so amazed that I can do that today. Hmm. I'm being evaluated right now to donate my liver. And I'm like, my, cause I'm so excited. My body parts are, are still good enough. Um, the, the, donate your liver while you live. Oh, oh a piece of it. A piece of it. Okay. They take a piece of it. Yeah. They cut a piece out. It grows back. The recovery is pretty, uh, brutal, but. I'm just excited that I can do that today. All these years of doing drugs and like killing my body. And like, you're telling me my body's good enough that I can, I can donate some body parts out. <laughs> I've been so excited, but I think this is the last thing I'm doing. Cause I'm getting carried away here, but like, it's exciting. Um, I, I'm just so, I'm, I can't believe it. Drugs did not take my body out. We snapped back. Right. Yeah. Huh. So it's just so it's just so exciting. Yeah, that's definitely crazy. I would never think of giving any part of my body to anyone. Well, you probably could. You're probably all healed up and stuff. But what I want to, I don't know. Yeah, I'm I know, sure. right? Like <laughs> maybe if my son or my daughter or somebody needed it, but some random dude you just gave your kidney to. Yeah. See, listen, I'm real spontaneous like that. I just wake up one day like I think I'm gonna try to give my kidney. I'm. Just I'm just real. I just want to give away my kids. Yeah. I'm very spontaneous <laughs> like that. I'm like, but you know, they said do service work and I got carried away with that. So I'm, I feel like my service work is filled for like the next couple of years. Yeah, I man. Yeah. yeah I, I, don't know. I think so. I mean, it's a kidney. I just, it's so amazing how much damage we do. And 
I'm just, I'm just blown away. Absolutely blown away. Cause I had, I had hep C for like so long and I got cured, but I'm like, I just can't believe there's not more damage to my body, mm, my sure. organs. And the doctors are like, no, your body heals itself. And I'm like, well, uh, 15 years, I would think it would take 15 years to heal here. Well, you know, apparently I did it in five. Yeah. The human body is definitely an amazing thing. Yeah. So like, you know, if you get clean, like the options, I'm realizing the options are endless. Like you can do things like I hear everybody say, I'm a felon. I can't get a job. That, that shit don't apply no oh, more. Shit. It doesn't apply no more. You don't want to work. You might not be able to go be a doctor or a lawyer. That's cool. But like they, they, there's just a ton of people going to hire you. Like it just. You can't get a job doing that easy shit. You know what I mean? Right. You, you got to no. get construction jobs are yeah. out there all over the place. People will give you a shot. You might have to actually work. Like, yeah. You, Chances of you going to Amazon or someplace like that where you're just a number on the wall. Right. It's different. But no, when you can go plead your happen. case to somebody and be like, yeah, it's a little bit different. But I think it comes back to everybody's just so distracted by everything else. They don't care about working or they want everything for free. Right. Yeah. People want to hand out. And yes. like Or say the poor me's poor me's. Mm-mm. That that's, that is not going to work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That self pity shit, man, really kills me. Yeah, yeah. Me, me too. Get up, brush yourself off, dry your eyes, go, go do your damn thing. Like, yeah, because it can happen. Like, you know, I mean, well, I tell I was telling everybody I had twelve felonies. Turns out it's eighteen. You know, I got a no few shit. jobs. Yeah, it turns. I, yeah, I got eighteen. Eighteen felonies. Apparently, I think I, got, I, think I got ten. Yeah, I think I got around ten. So I'm, I'm still only half you, and I thought I did some crazy shit. Yeah, because I just applied to be able, you know, deliver groceries from Walmart. So they wanted to give me a copy of my report, and I was like, "Well, that's a little more than I thought." <laughs> but it's okay. I don't. <laughs> I still do DoorDash. They they will take me and all my felonies, so they didn't care. But like, you know, it didn't stop me from doing anything. Right. I went to class to be a peer recovery specialist for the state of Virginia. You know, they don't care about my felonies. I could go get a job doing that. I don't. I use it and I volunteer. But, you know, um, people in the recovery, like there's a whole ton of companies that doesn't care about your felonies. Yeah. And I, I got tired of, le- I, I just leaned into it. Fuck it. That's where mm-hmm. I'm at with it anymore. It's like I, I've come home from prison and I was embarrassed and I didn't want to go around people because I feel like they just looked at me like this. Oh, you prison, prison, you know, convict. Yeah. So I didn't want to go and do certain things. And I've just leaned into like, fuck it. I'll tell you anything. What do you want to know? Prison sucked. Jail sucked. Right. Addiction sucked. It all sucked. What do you want me to talk? You know what I mean? Fuck it. I'm not going to hide that. I don't want to hide that. I just want to keep it real. Yeah. I mean, there came a point in time where I'm like so proud of my story because it's not where I'm at today. So like I will, I will proudly tell anything about my story because hey you know this is me today it's right that's not where i'm at so yeah which which like my mugshot looks crazy so i love showing that and during my celebration my five-year celebration um somebody shared that i looked like the first 10 seasons of the walking dead or first 10 episodes of the walking dead Uh and i was like oh my god i really do and I, I share that proudly because, like, the difference is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, I just found all my IDs from back. The first one I have is when I was 23. Pictures of a couple of my IDs and then, like, a lot of my prison IDs, too. Yeah. I look pretty bad in a couple of them. And I encourage people to, like, look at your old mugshots. See the difference because that's important. Yeah, see where you are, not where you've right. been. Yeah, Absolutely. And that's one thing I tell a lot of my sponsees because addicts are so hard on their self. They're like, I'm terrible. I'm failing. I, I'm just, I can't do this. And so I encourage them. I want you to look at yourself a year ago. And, you know, I hate to say Facebook, but Facebook is really good at this. They'll remind you your memories. shit years ago. But look at yourself a year ago. What is the difference? Now look at yourself six months, a month ago. What were you doing? Are you better? Yeah. Then stop being so damn hard on yourself because if you've gotten better, then you're doing it. But we are, we tend to like, just look at this negative shit about ourselves and like run with that. We don't see the positive stuff. Yeah. It's easy to see all that negative shit though. Yeah. And so my network of people I talk to, I always tell everybody, I love when people call me out because you see some shit about me that I'm never going to be able to see about myself. Right. So by all means, call me out. You know, I, I appreciate I'm gonna call that. You out. 
Yeah. I'm going to call you out. Yeah, I, I love so it. So call me out. That's what, I, that's what I tell all my friends. I'm going to call you on your shit, so don't stop calling me, man. Call yeah. me. Tell me what I'm doing wrong, what I what you don't like, what you see. Tell me, because I'm not going to hold back on you. Yeah. So yeah. why would you hold back on me? Yeah, I like I it. like those honest talks. They're Absolutely. the only ones that make me go home and really think. Or I get in the truck after the conversation, I'm, and I'm thinking about it. I'm like, was he full of shit, or is what he's saying true? And then I started thinking about it. And that's the only way you're ever going to think about it is somebody brings it up. Right, right. Yeah, I love it. Because people say shit about me and I'm like, really? What? And then, yeah, you think about it later like, damn, I never saw that about myself because right. we can't see it about ourselves because we're living it. So it's hard to see like, mm-hmm. sometimes it's hard to see our progress because we're we're living this thing. So I often have to remind, I mean, it's just not people I sponsor. It's anybody in recovery that they're like, you know, it, it, this is so hard for me to do. Well, uh, take a look at yourself a year ago. Were you, were you sleeping on the street? Were you, you that's not you today. So right. there's your progress. You need to look at that. Like, I don't know. Goals too, man. I think it's about goals and, and, and being able to see that too. I got a couple of guys that act like they want to do something, but they just don't take action. No. Sit here and talk about it. Talk about what oh, they're going to do. God. Talk about what they can do. Talk about the idea of it. All that sounds great. And then the next thing you know, they're laying on the fucking couch sleeping at right. one o'clock. And so a lot of people that I hang out with today, that's one thing that um, I really focus on. I don't want to hear you. I want to see you. I want to see what you're doing. Facts. I don't want to, I don't want to hear you talk. And like people do a lot of talking. Yeah. What are you doing? My most recent thing is I've come up with for myself anyways, is I expect people to be who they are. So if mm-hmm. I know you're a liar, I'm expect you to be a liar. If right. I know you're always late, I'm expect you to be late. Yeah. You know what I mean? If I know you're this or that, I'm only expect you to be that. They say past behavior is the best dictator of future behavior. Yeah. Because if you've done it before, chances are you're going to do it again. So I've kind of started looking at that and being like, all right, how many times has this motherfucker been late? Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, probably going to be late today. Let me set an appointment for 12 instead of one. You know what I mean? (laughs) I, I do that, man, because I'm expecting them to do what they do or not show up at all. Sometimes yeah. I look at them and be like, yeah, we'll make this appointment and you'll move it in two weeks. And yeah. I just know that they're <laughs> going to do that. But I've learned how to, you know, not think that these people are going to do what I would do. Because that's the biggest thing for me is I, if I expect people to do shit the way I would do it. Never are they ever going to do that. That's funny. I was just talking about that because like, okay, sometimes I'm a little gullible with people. I, I'm really, I'm very, I'm still naive today. And, you know, like there was a guy at work that just had zero respect about a certain thing. But we look at people and we expect like how we would act. Um, You know, we expect people to have respect because I have like respect is like a huge God, thing for me. Respect is one of the biggest ones I've been yes. dealing with lately. But it doesn't work like that. No, it, it's unrealistic expectations. Yeah. It's unrealistic for them to see things the way you do. And it, it's it, it's a. Uh, it's negativity all in itself too, because like, I just get mad about it and it doesn't help me to get mad about yeah my expectation and you didn't do what I expected you to do. Now I'm mad at you. Never even told you I wanted you to do it. Right. I just expected you to do it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And now I'm mad about it. How stupid <laughs> is that? That's just so dumb. Yeah. Like, you know, you would, well, you know, you would expect people to have respect and common courtesy. It is not that common. Common, common cur- sense isn't all that common. Yeah, that, that, the facts. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I know what you mean about the respect to you, man. There's a, uh, I don't want to get too into it, but there's definitely things that go on around me that are way noisier than I like mm. and way at wrong times and with no regard to the other shit going on around. Yeah. yeah. And I just, sometimes it, I feel like Bart and Homer Simpson and I just, I just yes. choke them. You know what I'm saying? Like, Oh my God. But I don't. Yes. I stay calm. <laughs> it's hard. It is. It is so hard. But yeah, and I'm the same way because if I feel like choking the shit out of you, I'm going to enjoy every second of it and do it with a smile. And that's that psychotic part of me where I enjoy that anger because that's where I get my pleasure. And I'm like, no, not today. We're not going to do that. <laughs> but it's hard. It um, is, man. I'm not a violent person and I don't put my hands on people very often. You put your hands on me, I'll put my hands back on you. But I don't even like being touched, really. Just not, a, you know, uh, but yeah, when I get to that point to where it's just like that happens and I'm, uh, it's hard for me to stop when it I is. get to there. My voice changes and my fucking ears get yeah. red. and they, I, uh, Yeah. And that's one thing that I became aware of is once I get angry, I can't get myself down. 
Like, it'll be like hours and hours later, the other person's forgotten about it. I'm raging still. It's hard to draw back. I've gotten good at that. I, I had a thing happen a couple of days ago, probably, and I was furious. I mean, like, yeah. fucking just, you know, that kind of shaking, nervous and pissed off. And I called my buddy and I'm yelling at him on the phone for, I don't know, five minutes. It wasn't even his fault. Nothing to do with him. But I'm just telling him about what happened. And I felt pretty good when I got off the phone. Didn't take a few minutes. I was just like, oh, this is going on. And I hate this. And I hate that. And you suck. Okay. Talk to you later. And I felt good. Like I was able yeah. to deal with it instead of letting it control me throughout the day, man. That's one thing I've been focusing on a lot. Because I hate that feeling right there where you, you know, you're recognizing it, which is the first thing, right? To changing it. Yeah. Yeah. And wanting to change it. Yeah. It's so in it, that moment. It's in that moment that it's happening that it becomes difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And so when I took anger management, God, anger management used to piss me off. So bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> anger management pisses me it off. Does. Because, That's great. you know, I'd have this therapist in anger management and I, I did it for a year and I'm like, I, I can't. And eventually I was just like, I can't do this anymore. I mean, I quit, but I tell everybody, I feel like I graduated. So whatever. But in anger management, they tell you when you get mad in that moment, What's in your toolbox? You have to create this toolbox. I'm like, listen, lady, when I'm pissed off, I'm not thinking what's in my toolbox. Am I going to do breathing exercise? Like ain't nobody thinking about that. Anger management is very unrealistic. Um, I haven't went to an anger management class where it was someone legitimately used to get pissed off. No, it's some calm therapist that talks like this. And she's like, we're going to create our toolbox. And in this toolbox is everything you're going to do when you're going to get mad. My God, that she used to piss me off. Like, Fine. it's not yeah. tangible to the solution no. phase. It's, I mean, I can see certain things. Like, I have a thing where I see a good me and a bad me. There's a, a bad me and a, and a good me. And it, it, the bad me is who I don't want to be. The good me is who I want to be. But I see them in my, like, I see this filthy, dirty, rat's nest, bearded half dressed, whatever, you know what I mean? That he's just an idiot. He, he's getting high. He's doing crimes. And I don't want a, anybody to ever see that part of me. Yeah. And then there's me over here. And that's where I want to, I want to stay here. I don't want to be that part. So if they're trying to say like, Oh, look in your toolbox and see this little thing. Like that's hard to do, man. It's hard to, it's hard to visualize those yeah. things, these tools in your toolbox. It is hard to visualize that shit. Yeah. It's very unrealistic. And there was another gentleman in the class with me and his anger was probably just as bad as, as, uh, as mine, but they do this circle. They're like, first there's a thought. And we're trying to explain to this lady, when we get that mad, we don't skip the thought. Mm -hmm. We did the action and we think about it later. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it goes back to, if you're going to teach me something, you better understand where I'm coming from. Right. Yeah, this lady did not understand. But that's like the REBT therapy is what he's talking about, right? Rational, rational emotive behavioral therapy. Yeah, so yeah. you have a thought which creates a feeling and mm -hmm. then you act on that feeling and then there's a consequence. I went through all that shit too. Yeah. I feel like it does work that way, but the thought and the feeling are so Split second, so maybe. quick that sometimes yeah. you just can't. Sometimes it'll happen. You, you can, if you're sitting here like now and you're actually listening and you're thinking, you can stay because I can say, How do I want to respond? But then other things just flip that switch and you're just like, you know, angry immediately. Yeah, yeah. And I don't even know how I got to be like a calm person where I'm not like, you know, throwing hands and cracking heads at work anymore. Um, I think it was just like very, very snail pace progress. And eventually it does get easier. Like anything you do, you know, you quit using and eventually it's so hard and she gets easier. So I try, you know, use that with my anger. You know, I made myself shut the hell up. Now I don't want to say anything about it. I can brush it off. And another problem I had is people at work, they try to get me angry because they think it's so exciting because it's such a huge blow up and such a dramatic event. They tried it. So they didn't help because they try to get me there. They think it's hilarious. And, and I'm then like, they want to get their phones out and film you and laugh at yeah, you. Yeah, I'm like, you guys are not helping. They're like, we freaking love it. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> right? Look, man, my misery is not your entertainment, right. man. So that that is one thing that helped me too, because I'm like, uh, uh no, screw you guys. You ain't no, you don't have that control over me. And so I just, yeah, <sighs> I am so grateful that I am not such an angry person today. I'm even more grateful that people don't see me as an angry person today. Right. Because even a normal conversation at one point in time was like intimidating because I'm leaning in towards you and they're like, whoa, what? I'm like, what? I'm just talking to you. What? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, man. I hear you. 
it's definitely a, a whole different world when you stop doing all that bullshit. Yeah. And surrounding yourself by different people. I thought I could come home from prison and hang around with the same people doing the same shit and not do what I did before. Yeah. You know, okay, doing the yeah. same thing over and over, expecting different results. It never works. Right. Yeah, when I first came home from jail, um, you know, of course, being in drug court, they watch who you hang around so you can. But there were some guys that, you know, I used to use with that I considered to be like brothers. And I had to say goodbye to them. And it was really sad. You know, I got out of jail like November. So about December, I went to this guy. He was like, he was such a close brother to me, so like one of my best friends. And he came out of the house, cold, dead ass winter. And I hugged him. And he was so soaked with sweat. Mm. And I knew I'd never see him again because that's mm. just what his life was. And that's what my life wasn't anymore. It was really sad, though. It was hard to let people go. Um, and I still like think about that like it was yesterday because it was I've never seen him again. But I knew cold mm. as shit out. You sweat in the way you are like that. We were going on different paths. Right. Um, Grateful in that moment to not feel that way, but empathetic over. Oh man, I miss him. I miss him through. so much. Like we were so close. Like you know, that was like my little road dog. You know, hmm. man, we did everything together, and it, it was just—it was a really sad moment. And since then, I mean, he's messaged me and like, "Hey, I saw you at the store the other day. I didn't want to say anything, but I'm so proud of you. You look great." And then you know, actually, that wasn't even that long ago. And I don't know. I just I get sad all over again. Like God, I wish I could see him, but no, I can't. Right, and you know, you don't ever like tell him he could do the same thing or just feel like he's going to find it when he wants to find it. Yeah, that's what it is. He's not open to that. And, you know, um, he lives a lifestyle where um, it's just, that's just not where he's at today. Like, I just know it's not. So, right, there's another line you got to draw sometimes, isn't it? And you just got to know how far you can go. The door is open, but you got to walk It is because it. I had to learn. Okay, I had to learn the hard way. You cannot talk people. You cannot push them into recovery. No. And I think that is the hardest. Not for their family or their kids or right. no other reason than yeah. them. They got to do it for them. That has been the hardest thing about trying to help people is like talking to someone who who doesn't want it. Who doesn't Trying to help people who don't want to be helped. Hands down, hardest thing. Yeah, for sure. And I've learned to feel that out. People that are not ready to stop, I must well not waste a breath. I expect them to be who they are. It's been hard because you're just watching someone kill themselves. And I'm like, man, just listen to me. Their ears are not open. No. You have to wait. No, and it gets frustrating, doesn't it? It does. It gets frustrating when you're like, oh my God, if you would just do this, it would be okay. And then yeah. they leave your presence and go get a DUI. Yeah. I mean, I Literally, have... I've just had that happen in the last week. Oh, God. Literally, just went right to jail, got a DUI, like left here, paid him a couple bucks for doing a couple things around the house because he's broke, didn't have no work. I'm broke. I don't have no work either, yeah. but I'm still looking out for him because I like him. What's he do? Straight to a DUI. God, that's so hard. And I'm still trying to grasp that concept. So one thing I try to tell people, um, I compare it to a little kid. A little kid walks and you want to catch them when they fall. Catch them when they fall. Got to let them fall. Yeah, sometimes I got to realize that it's going to hurt. Yeah, I because I, I can tell you, watch your step all day long. But if you don't fall, then you're not going to learn to fix your steps. So, um, it's, then that one is so hard cause you got to let people make their own mistakes, but sometimes their mistakes is going to take their life. Yeah. That's what I was just going to say. Sometimes that mistake ends up hurting them or hurting somebody else to a point of not being able to be changed. Yeah. So I can only just tell people, okay, call me, call me before it's too late. Call me when you're scared or, which is again, why I put that on Facebook. If you're someone using today, call me, I'll talk to you. I'm not gonna talk you out of it, but I'll, I'll talk to you. Right. I'll be here for you. I'm a safe person because I'm not using. I, re I remember one of my last days using, <laughs> um, I was using meth and I had this enormous shed and I had stayed in the shed for so long that like we were storing boxes and stuff and I turned my boxes and I made a couch, but you know, I just made all this furniture with like the stuff we were storing, but I was scared. I was so scared because I was alone and I was up for like a week. And your mind starts to wonder, I was terrified. And I didn't have anybody safe to call. Um, which is funny because I used to play this this game on this app on my phone. And, you know, you have a whole team. The head of that team, some guy in California, that's who I ended up calling. He gave me his number. Oh, and it's such like an amazing story. It was, it was this game called Kill Shot Bravo. You know, you have like 50 people on the team. 
And I got on that app for whatever reason. And the leader of that team, he said, call me. And he lived in California and he talked to me for five hours. He didn't use older guy. And he talked to me. He talked to me as long as he's like, I'm just going to sit here with you. And um, funny stories, you know, I went to jail. He ended up getting my address to the jail and he ended up writing me. My name on that game was Psycho Mom. So he ended up addressing the Psycho Mom. And then so I would know it was from him. Um, so three years ago, I actually met that man in person. No shit. It was amazing. He ended up coming to Pennsylvania. And he will all, and I, you know, and even when I got out of jail and I got to the recovery house, he would call me on video on Facebook, him and his mom, and they would send me gifts. They sent me a scarf to keep me warm at the recovery house. And they sent me earbuds with the note that said, this is when you want to, you know, have the world disappear. And, um, um, it, it was so amazing. Uh, I, I got to meet him when he got married in Pennsylvania to his wife today, hmm. but they helped me. He helped me so much. And I first met him on a game. Uh, right. This, crazy this, world. Huh? It is. It's so funny how that turned out. Cause he will always be that guy that talked to me when I didn't have anybody. Right. He just sat on the and, and now that that was, that's such a, a part of what happened for you. You want to be able to do that for other people. Yes. Yes. So, you know, um, how, and been, how crazy would it be if some addict from California reached I mean, out to you? I would you. love that. And I'm thinking about that post, and I don't know if you saw that post where I'm like, hey, call me. I've been thinking about turning it into a reel because it goes further. Okay. For no other purpose, but I need more people to see this because nobody, not there's not enough people saying, hey, you don't know me, so I'm the perfect person for you to call and talk to. I don't know your business. I don't know who you are. Vent your shit to me. Like, I want more people to be able to do that just because- I needed that person. Well, where can they reach you at? Anybody that sees this might want to reach out. Where well, can they reach you at? Well, you know, um, Erica Barnes on Facebook. Send me a message. I'll shoot you my number. Um, yeah, or, you know, I, I don't care about giving money. That's your, that's your main social media app that anybody can find you on. Yes, it's- yes. And um, I stay on there a lot um, for that reason of reaching out to people. I'll copy stuff. a link and put it in the description. Yes, absolutely. So if anybody messages me, you can talk to me on messenger or we can exchange phone numbers. We can talk on video, however you feel comfortable. You know, some people need a face to face interaction. So like, if you call me on video messenger, I'll sit on video and talk to you. You know, I can sit and talk to you privately for however, however long you want. I don't ever sleep. I have so many jobs. I don't ever sleep. I swear I don't. So it it's doesn't like, matter. That's leftover mess. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't sleep. You yeah, still can't sleep. It's still wearing off. I got another three, mm. you know, three to ten years. But like, no, absolutely, share a link because um, you know, if it's three a.m., if my phone rings, I'm gonna freaking answer because I know them three a.m. calls. Um, I I know what that is. There ain't nobody calling me at three o'clock in the morning for anything. You know, it it it's urgent. Right. Absolutely. So um, better be urgent. Call yeah. Me at 3 yeah. O'clock. Well, I know it is because everybody that is currently using or used with in the past, you know, they're they're no longer in my life. So, and I have I have gotten those calls at two o'clock in the morning, like people crying, like, "Okay, I'm gonna wake up. Let's talk about it. I will make time for you. I want to make time for people today because it helps me so much. It helps me to realize that my life was not for nothing. My recovery is not for nothing. It's to serve a bigger purpose." And, you know, whoever's out there using and you are my purpose. And whenever you're ready, like I just I just there's so much um, in talking to these people today, like just talking to you. I'm not going to talk you out of it. Just being present with people. Um, I don't know. That's what gets me excited in life today. It really does. Um, it, it does, because um, I just I, I, I am a person that likes to pay it forward. I teach that to my kids, paying it forward. And there were so many people who helped me new in recovery and showed me how to do things. I want to be that person today. And somebody else that brought it up to me was like, when we're being of service of people and we're helping people out, it kind of, I feel like it X's out the people that I stole from or I hurt so many years. Um, what, Karma. Yeah, it doesn't X it out. But like as many people as I hurt, stole from and sold drugs to, I need to help out that many people today. And Again, you need to spend as much effort in yes. this life as you did getting high. Absolutely. I think that's a key too. One thing I learned in recovery stuff is, uh, you know, how many hours a day, how much money, how much oh, time God. did you spend getting high? And then when you think about that and say, if you converted that into doing something productive, where would you be right now? Right. So regardless of where I would have been, I know where I'm going because okay. that's all I do. I'm not focused on anything but being productive. 
not and, being negative. And you know what cracks me up these days? So if somebody gets clean, what really like kills me is like we would walk 10 miles to the dope man's house. But, you know, I talk to some people that don't drive and they're like, I don't drive. I'm not going to work that job a mile down the road. Dude, you walk 10 miles and three feet of snow to yep. get a bag. Barefooted. Like, stop. To get a bag. Walk your ass out mile to work. Mm -hmm. It's not that bad. Um, yeah, I think that's always a good comparison, too, when somebody won't do something or don't want to do something. And they, you know they've went to extreme limits just to get high. <laughs> yeah, I hate to bring this up, but somebody told me that one time because, like, the COVID vaccine. I'm like, absolutely not. They're like, you shot up mud pot of water and you're scared to death to put this in. You know, mm -hmm. I'm like... Well, yes, I am. Yes, okay. Thank you very <laughs> much. Care. That is my choice. It yes. was your choice to not shoot mud water and it is my choice not to take your little shot. Right, right. Yes, I have shot up tulip bowl water, but I will not do this today. I'm different. <laughs> I'm a different person today. <laughs> I don't have to live like that anymore. Yeah, yeah. Do you know Dan Dan? Dan Dan. Dan, uh shit, I can't think of his last name. Sarah Nelms buddy. I think so. God, he goes to recovery all the time. I can't think of his last uh uh. He puts it on his stupid Facebook. But anyways, uh, I want to get him on here. I didn't know if you knew him or not. Is that not. the hippie Dan? Yeah, it probably is, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I call him Dan Dan. He's yeah. on Facebook as like Dan Frankenfist or some shit like that. Shaggy. Is it Shaggy? Might be that one too. I think he's got two Facebook accounts. He does. Here. Okay, it is and that guy. And he writes back and forth to himself. It is that guy. That's him. Do you oh, like old God. Dan Dan? I yes. I enjoy listen. time with Dan. I worked with Dan for like a year and a half, man. He's a very smart person and he has a lot of good shit to say. I can't I wait to I think sit it's down. The same with guy. Him. Yeah, I tolerate him. I mean, if he hears this, I love you, Dan. You know, it's one of them yeah, he he's he's good people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't wait to sit with him. Yeah. I don't even know why I brought that up. He does. He has some good good things to say, but hey, man, goofy as hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's silly. He's silly yeah. as shit. But that's what I think is gonna be interesting about him too, man, is because it takes all kinds. Some people are super serious and some people are not. And I'm not a super serious person. This is more of the most serious settings you're going to see on my channel. Right. Because, you know me, I'm a clown. I like to laugh. Yeah. But yeah. at the same time, too, I think this is important. Yeah. You know, and that's what I enjoy, like, when going to the meetings and stuff. Because it it's so funny that um, there will be, like, the hippie guy in there. I've seen lawyers. I've seen doctors. High class, low class. But we all get along because we're all serving like one purpose. Uh, that's been really interesting. You see all types of people in there and it doesn't matter. They don't care like where you come from, who you are, or what do you do today. They care that you clean today and you're in that, right. in that room. And that's that's been really nice. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Definitely a melting pot of many cultures it and is. races and Yeah, because the shit stories. doesn't discriminate, doesn't care who you are. It's Absolutely make, not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, Oh, Paul was a, do you remember Paul? Yes. Yeah, that was, I didn't want to say his last name, but I thought that was a crazy thing too, man, because he was a lawyer for us and all that when we went to the feds. And then by the time I come home, it was all that crazy shit going on. And yeah. I was in a class with the girl, I'm pretty sure it was the girl that told on him because she was in a drug class with us. And yeah. So that just blew me away. Cause like, you feel like some of them people are untouchable yeah. by your bullshit. Like you sit there and they prosecute you all the time. And, and it's like, next thing you know, it's like, wow, they're getting, yeah. Holy shit. There is no limit to this stuff. You they really can. don't ever know what's going on with people either. Yeah. But Paul's helping a lot of people today. I don't know if you've seen him today, but okay. he is, he's a peer recovery specialist and Sweet. he works under another lawyer and they're helping a lot of people today. They That's go to bat awesome. for, dude, I would love to get his story. Oh man! I wonder if he would talk to me. I bet he would. You should definitely reach out to him because that would be great. He um he he goes to bat for addicts and so to defend them instead of going to jail and no wasting shit. their time, get them. Let's get them in a program. And he's one of the people we talked about earlier that you can identify with. Mm -hmm. So when you're sitting there talking to that lawyer and they're judging you on your drug addictions, he can actually look at you and say, "I understand." Yes. Yes. Huh. Yeah. I've sat down and talked to him and that's how I know of this. I went in, in his office and talked to him to help. No shit. Help I need somebody. that address because I will go straight in there and talk to him. Yeah. And just ask should. him if he'll do this. Or you should hit him on Facebook. He does respond pretty quickly. No shit. Yeah. As soon as he sees my name, he's going <laughs> to. Yeah, he'd probably be excited. He's going to see my name and be like, oh shit, what's this about? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Yes, I would like to do that. I need to write that name down or need you to send me something. So I remember I'll send you a message or something. Yeah, from sitting in his office, he is so excited to help people today. 
and, and that's great. That, that's what he's doing. Going that's good shit, man. And yeah. I know he he could sit down and definitely have a story. I, and I don't even know his story. Oh, I would love to hear that too. Yes, <laughs> no shit. That's I'm on it. I'm on it. Definitely yeah, because that, that. that must have been a hell of a ride, you know. Yeah, I'm all over that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, definitely. dude, thanks for coming in, man. I yeah. knew this was going to be good. I knew you had good shit to say. You said you weren't going to be able to talk very much, and I think you did great. Yeah, I probably talked too much. Nah, you did thanks good. Thanks for having me. You did good, dude. So, like I say, I'll drop a Facebook link. Uh, yes, definitely. That way, if any of y'all want to reach out to Erica, man, you know, there'll be a link in the description. She says she will take your calls anytime. Yes, definitely. Let me know in the comments what y'all think, man. Um, like, subscribe, and share. See y'all for the next one.